My dear and the beloved in Christ, Father Thomas Plasman, his book from Sunday to Sunday, had some short comments about today's Mass and the liturgy. He says, The altar is in festive attire. Flowers and greenery adorn the sanctuary. The organ bursts forth in happy strains. Today, the predominant dating color is rose. This color standing midway between the purple, which symbolizes penance, and the glowing red of unbounded jubilation is chosen because although the Lord is near, we as yet do not know him, and we are still engaged in making straight his way. And this is the reason, too, for the ember days during the week. These go farther back into antiquity than the season of Advent itself. Originally, they mark the three harvests of wheat, wine, and oil, all of which fruits have been drafted into the sacramental service. Ember days are days of penance and of prayer, prayer for the world, for the church, and especially for those who are promoted to holy orders. And as you know, this past week we had three young men ordained as priests. If only our Catholic people would attend Holy Mass in these days and devoutly follow the liturgy, a joyful new experience bearing great spiritual comfort would be their reward. My dear and beloved in Christ, according to F Father Kevin O'Sullivan, when St. John the Baptist appeared at the Jordan River, proclaiming that the kingdom of God was at hand, the Jews flocked to hear him. The expectation of the promised Messiah the Redeemer, was strong at this time. And here was a prophet announcing his proximate arrival and calling on the people to repent of their sins in order to prepare to receive him. To stir their souls to desire for moral purification, St. John baptized his followers. It was not the sacrament of baptism instituted later by Christ. It expressed one's true interior sorrow for sin, its value was dependent on the interior acts of contrition. The temple authorities in Jerusalem, hearing of the multitudes who were flocking to John, became interested and perhaps alarmed. And they sent a delegation of priests and Levites down to the Jordan to interrogate St. John the Baptist. Who art thou? St. John understood their question to mean, Art thou the Christ? And he answered, I'm not the Christ. The Christ means the anointed. And it's a Greek translation of Messiah, the Hebrew word for the promised Redeemer. According to the prophecies, the Redeemer was to be prophet, priest, and king. And as each of these officials were publicly anointed with oil before taking up office, so the Redeemer was given the name the Anointed. The Christ. Art thou Elias? It was a common opinion among the Jews at this time that the prophet Elijah would come back to earth to announce the arrival of the Messiah and to anoint him publicly as Messiah. Our Lord himself told the apostles that St. John the Baptist had fulfilled this role of Elias. Art thou the prophet? Besides Elias, the Jews expected also Enoch or Jeremiah as a precursor of the Redeemer. And when St. John the Baptist denied that he was either the Messiah or Elias or the precursor prophet, they naturally asked him who he was and what right he had to call these people to penance and to baptize them. I am the voice of one crying in the desert. With deep humility, St. John the Baptist simply states that he's the messenger sent by God to prepare the people for the coming of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah had foretold. Then he quotes the text of Isaiah, in which the prophet describes the arrival of the Messiah as that of an oriental monarch. When an eastern potentate was about to visit a neighboring monarch, heralds were called out to send workers to smooth the desert paths and to prepare a straight way on which the royal visitor could walk. 
St. John was fulfilling this prophecy. He was calling on the people to prepare their hearts for the arrival of their Lord. His baptism, he truly states, is simply the washing of the body with plain water to symbolize the washing of the soul from sin by true contrition. Then he goes on to tell them, in the midst of you there has stood one whom you do not know. By these words, St. John the Baptist shows his insight into the minds of the Pharisees. Christ was the promised Messiah, but the Pharisees would not accept him because they were not looking for a spiritual redeemer, but from one who would free them from the yoke of the Romans and set up Palestine as a great temporal power once more. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. He it is who is to come after me. St. John then goes on to proclaim the dignity of Christ. I preceded him in time, but he is above me in dignity because he was before me. St. John the Baptist was senior to Christ as man. He was six months older. But here, the Baptist indicates a previous existence of Christ, an everlasting existence in his divine nature. Then truly but humbly, St. John states that he's not worthy to perform the most menial task, even loosening the sandal, the strap of the sandal of Christ. What humility in the one chosen by God to be Christ's precursor. Evangelist then tells us where all this happened, namely in the little village of Bethany on the eastern bank of the Jordan River, not far from Jericho. My dearly beloved in Christ, the church has chosen today's gospel for the third Sunday of Advent in order to keep before our eyes the fact that this is a season of preparation for the coming of our Lord at Christmas. The words of St. John the Baptist, I'm the voice of one crying in the desert, make straight the way of the Lord, should find a ready response in our hearts. We have a great advantage over the Jews of that day. We have seen the proofs of his divinity. We have known from our early years that he suffered and died the shameful death on the cross in order to open the gates of heaven for us. We have learned that the royal road to heaven is the way of the cross. If anyone, any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Yes, we've learned this, and we do not the, doubt the truth of our Lord's own words. Yet in our daily lives, do we put them into practice? The leaders of the Jews in St. John the Baptist's day wanted a Messiah who would give them the good things of this life. A crucified king they would not admit. Every time we make the sign of the cross, we proclaim Christ to be our king. But is our loyalty often not, off, often not end there? Do we not often grumble about God's providence when he sends us a cross? When the observance of his Ten Commandments demands self-denial, do we not question his right to make such calls on our weak human nature? My dear beloved Christ, have we not often translated our Lord's solemn statement, what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world but suffer the loss of his soul? Into, what does it profit me if I should gain heaven, if I must lose this money, which is received unlawfully, or forego this sinful pleasure? There are all too many nominal followers of Christ today who, like the Jews of old, want only a Messiah who will give them the wealth and the pleasures of this world. Like St. John the Baptist, the church today is a lonely voice, a single voice crying out to the world, make straight the way of the Lord. Keep the commandments of God. And like St. John the Baptist, she too is questioned, who are you? Right, what right have you to teach penance? You're not the Christ we want. My dearly beloved in Christ, Bethany beyond the Jordan is far from your hometown. 
and 21 centuries separate us from today's gospel story. But the voice of St. John the Baptist still calls out, The Lord is coming. I must prepare my soul to receive him. I'd just like to close with this story. A prince who later became the king of England when he was a young boy liked the ocean very much. He liked to fish and swim and boat, but most of all, he liked sailing. This prince and his brother went sailing one summer in and around the beautiful bays and rivers of Scotland. They let the wind take them far north into a beautiful bay near Inverness. They decided to take a hike through the highland hills. What wild and lonely paths they walked. How they enjoyed the fresh air and the beautiful scenery. But they forgot just how to get back. They became lost. On and on they wandered. It was growing darker and darker and they were so tired that they decided just to lie down for a moment and wait for morning till they saw a light. They hurried over to the little house where the light was shining and knocked loud and long on the door. At first nobody answered. Then all of a sudden they heard a voice, Get away from here or I'll sick the dog on you. Clear out. There's nothing to do but leave that unfriendly place. Not far away, they found another house, and these people took them in, gave the boys something to eat and a bed for the night. Next morning, the boys told the people who they were. Like lightning, the news went from cottage to cottage. Prince George and his brother had been lost during the night and had stayed with one of the Highlanders. Imagine how the man felt who had driven them away. And imagine how happy the people were who took them in. You can be sure that the unfriendly family did not receive any favors from the future king, while the friendly people, the family who had taken them in and took care of them, did receive many favors and gifts. Something like this happened to us. It happens to us at this time of the year. There's a king who's far from his home in heaven. He's down here on earth looking for a place to stay. He's looking for a heart that will take him in. That king is Jesus. Will, will any of you say, get out of here or I'll sick my dog on you? No, we would not even think of that. We love our Lord and we want him to come to our home and to our heart. Still, there are many who drive Jesus away. By committing sin, by doing bad things, they drive Jesus away. They tell Jesus to get out. When we read the gospel a few minutes ago, we read about St. John the Baptist. Do you remember what he said? He said, In the midst of you there has stood one whom you do not know. What did he mean by those words? St. John was telling the people who lived at the time of Jesus that the Lord was right there among them. He was right there at the door, but they did not know Jesus. They did not admit him and let him in. There are many people like that today who have never heard of Jesus. Right here in the United States, there are thousands of children who do not know who Jesus is. If they met Jesus on the street, they would not know him. There are millions of people who don't know what that Christmas is the birthday of Jesus. Just try to imagine not knowing that. But they don't. There are millions and millions of people who if they saw a crib would ask, what's that? Who is that? Who's that baby? What's the idea of sleeping in a stable? They don't know Jesus was born in a stable and took his naps in a stable because the people would not let them come into their houses. My dearly beloved in Christ, don't drive our unknown king away by sin. Invite him by saying your prayers these days better than you've ever said them before. And invite Jesus into your heart by trying to be like him. 
obedient, kind, virtuous. Thank God we know Jesus. Thank God we love Jesus. Thank God we have Jesus as a guest in the house of our hearts. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.